think it's a great time travel novel. Yeah, no, no, it was it was a lot of fun. It, it was it's a love letter to military science fiction, right? Because I love I'm, I'm the same. I love military science fiction, um, but it is it, you know the the politics of a lot of military science fiction just. Um, well, and some of it, the politics are right. Haldeman does a great job. Anyway, we could, we could go all day. We we'll probably will about yeah. that. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I loved I loved writing it. It it uh, I it was probably one of my geekiest uh, love letters of a book for sure. Uh, the stars are legion. Oh my gosh. Um, I just well, I'll tell you the story of the book cover. But the stars are legion. I just tell people. It is a space opera, and then they freak the f out when they <laughs> when they read it. But that gets them in the door. Is it's a space opera uh, about you know somebody who's, who has lost their memory uh, and is being asked to um, you know take over this this world ship on behalf of people uh, whose nefarious inclinations she's not quite uh, not quite on the up and up with. Um, you know, I, I really. That was that was a fun one because it's all um, uh, cisgendered women, um, and they all give birth to like parts of the spaceships. Basically, they're all organic ships, uh, so it's all women. And and yeah, and somebody had said there was some review uh, where she was like, "Oh, this is and again, oh, liberal crap, blah blah blah. What is this? Lesbians in space?" I'm like, "Yes, yes, that's exactly what it is." So I did. I did the mock cover, Lesbians in Space. Oh man, I have one around here somewhere. But I did a mock cover and it was like everything then became no, like no, lesbians no. in space. Lesbians in space. Okay, okay, do it. I'll keep going, I'll keep going. I gotcha. Um, so yeah, so it was really fun because um we had that was like a, a tipping point for people finding the novel. Um it was one of those really great examples of how a bad review is actually a good review uh because i'm talking about how a bad review is like a good review yes because uh it had it helped people who would love that kind of book find the book uh and that book did really well it sold better than you know all my books up until then and it's still selling uh, very well so again it, it it finds its audience uh don't be afraid to be like to embrace what your book really is <laughs> Yeah, my, my best friend actually had me as her birthing partner, um, and I wore, wore my Rocky t-shirt, and, you know, we went, and she was induced, and we did the whole uh, thing, and it was it was a close one. They brought in the crash cart. They thought they'd have to do a C-section, um, and uh, it was, we had, I mean, the alarm went off, right, when the heartbeat stops, and I'm like, we're going to fucking push, <laughs> and it's like, there's this myth, there's this and my mom talks about it, right? About being in that birthing room or giving birth to a kid. There is a visceral life and death thing about it. And when it's that close, um, it was a it was a really uh, powerful experience, right? Um, and you know, they're taking the kid away, and you know, why isn't he crying? We're all you know the room. There's like 20 people in the room at this point because they're afraid they're gonna have to. You know, they were afraid they're gonna have to do a C-section. Um, and you know, and that baby cry. I'm like, everybody in the room loses their shit. But it's amazing, really visceral, like you said, a very visceral thing, uh, where you realize how cool it is, like that that you have this superpower where you can make other humans. Like, how cool is that? It's gross, but cool at the same time. And I think I think that. You know, um, we forget about that a lot. It's like, oh, that's women in the blah, 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 thing. I will never forget afterwards, the nurse came up to me. She goes, are you a professional doula? You did really well. I thought you'd do this in profession. <laughs> and I'm like, I have my Rocky shirt on. We're getting this kid out. I was very focused. Um, so yeah, so a lot of that went in there, and you know, my agent afterwards, you know, she uh, went through pregnancy and birth, and she said, Cameron, you could have been, you could have been way more visceral, Cameron. It moves, Cameron, it moves inside. I was like, I know, I could have been worse. So I actually took it easy on people. Listen, uh, I definitely wrote that as a standalone novel, um, <laughs> because of course the irony was, at the time, I was hearing a lot of people say, Oh, I want to read standalones. I'm tired of these 27 book series. 
But the key is, of course, is write a book that lots of people love and characters. Because then I wrote the book, and then everyone's like, so where's the sequel? I want to know what happens next. And I said, I wrote a standalone for you people. I wrote you a standalone, and this is how you repay me. You want to buy more books from me. Um, so, so there are certainly, uh, again, I, you know, my, my God's War books, um, the, my first series, I write a lot of short fiction and stuff in that world. So I may do short fiction, but I don't see doing a longer form. Um, it is a very visceral <laughs> sort of book. I recommend though yeah. to people who, who like that, that really gritty visceral stuff to read um, Melvin Burgess's Blood Tide. Uh, which has him fighting all these crazy monsters, and they've it's based on like this old um, Icelandic saga, and it's uh, really interesting. That's far future, like London or somewhere, and there's mutants. And anyway, uh, also very gooey uh, and very very much in my wheelhouse. So that was definitely an inspiration for that particular book. For for those of you who didn't hear me before, uh, I'm I'm Gray, and I'm the. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm now the mail clerk uh, at <laughs> World Builders. Used to be the interim executive director, um, but uh, that's what happens when you try and twitch alone. That's what happens. That's, that's what'll happen. So, all right. Uh, well, you know, and the other good part is that I'm pretty sure that we can. Um, we'll just we'll fix it in post. That's what they say, fix right? Fix it in post. Yeah, absolutely. I can that's just the add these thing. together that's and recording. Yep. Yeah. Um, so. I, I gotta say, so one of the, I just, one more thing about the Lesbians of Spain, the, sorry, the Stars of Legion uh, book that you made. <laughs> I, uh, I, I answered either one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. One of the reasons I really enjoyed it, one of the things I like about, about all of your um, books uh, is you, you ask a lot of your readers, uh, like you don't, you don't give things, you don't put out a lot of, um, a lot of stuff about here's how this world works. Here's why the world works this way. You know, like like there's the movie Ice Station Zebra, which is known for being all men, but it's all men because it's up on Ice Station Zebra and it's military in the '60s and they only have men at this station. Women exist in the world, like there are there are presence, but in yours in in the Stars of Legion, like men just aren't there. Like there's no oh. hey, what happened to the men or oh, remember how those men were? It's just they're just not there. And in um, uh, and I, I, when I went out there, I grabbed a bunch of things in your, um, the, uh, uh, the mirror empire, you know, the world breaker saga. I had to read this twice when the second one came out because I'm like, this has so many layers to it. I mean, I love it cause you just, you just really envelop, uh, how, do, how do you go about that kind of world building? Not to, you know, put that in there because it's our business, but. No, you know, it's, um. I I am I love world building. I, I just love it. It's one of the things I really love to uh, to do is because I love to use fiction as a way to go places that um, uh, that we haven't seen before. And I love to see and I love to see how those environments change people. And mm. you know, if we picked up humanity and we put it somewhere else where everything around it was different, how would humanity be different? Um, that's a fascinating question to me and something that you know, I think can be seen across all of my work is, you know, what about humans remains the same and what is malleable, right? Um, and a lot of that comes down to, you know, if I um, make environmental changes or I make social changes or um, all of these different, again, it's that, it's that, it's messing with timelines too. It's like, what if this was different? What if that was different? Um, so a lot of times I'll take, I'll sit down and say, okay, what have I not done before? I think Mirror Empire is a great example because I had just come off writing uh, the God's War trilogy, which was a society that was powered by insects, um, mm -hmm. which uh, came from me living in South Africa uh, for some time and, and living in a cockroach infested flat. Uh, and after that experience, I was like, okay, I've done bugs and this amazing post-apocalyptic and Mad Max world. How do I top that, right? Like, how do I do something different um, that is still an interesting world that I like to explore. And the answer was uh, going back to what interests me. Uh, I am a gardener. Uh, I love to garden. I love plants. Um, I also hate plants and I'm full of poison <laughs> ivy all the time. I want them to die. But anyway, uh, and so I was like, well, what if I did like toxic plants or semi sentient toxic plants? Mm -hmm. um, I read Semiosis by Sue Burke recently, which oh, was amazing. Mm -hmm. I read the book of Coley. 
uh, by M.R. Carey, which is a ton of fun because it's another one that's evil plants. Um, and uh, so I wanted to see what I could do with that. And when it came then to the magic system, again, looking at what I had done before, I was like, what can I do that I haven't seen before? And I love this idea of, you know, some people are powerful um, at different periods of time. So as these stars come into the sky, some people are, are powerful, but they know they're only going to be powerful and have magic for 10 years or whatever. And then the next one is ascendant, right? And so you have to have this mm -hmm. incredibly interesting and intricate balance of political power um, among all these different factions of people. I love that idea um, as far as magic systems go, because I felt that that would lead to some of the most interesting politics and interactions between <laughs> humans. Um, Most so yeah, so that was, yeah, those were my two, those are my two big pillars for that one. Um, just looking at, and which is, you know, my agent and I had talked about it. It's like, you know, what, what do a lot of fantasy fans really focus on is they want a unique magic system and a different world, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so that unique magic system had to, um, especially with Sanders, I mean, Sanders has taken like magic systems to the next level. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, everybody's like, oh, go to the bar's race. Um, so yeah, so that's where those, that's where those ones came from. Um, just kind of, you have to sit down and go, what, a, what am I interested in? And to me, that's always number one. If you're writing something you're not interested in, it's, you're screwed. So it's, what am I interested in? What have I not seen before? Um, and, you know, remixing a lot of things, um, that you can counter. So. Yeah. Uh, my girlfriend is a horticulturist and she had, uh, semiosis was a big favorite of hers. And, uh, I have, I have described some of the the plants in the mirror empire world and, and things like that and yeah they're pretty powerful stuff you know you uh you mentioned actually for, for this part we're going to take a brief segue to do two things we will say hey this is the bourbon that i'm going to drink right now <laughs> <laughs> just got this recently um and also uh, uh cameron you can't see it but the twitch stream um we have the project hope is the charity that we are helping out for this whole fundraiser and um, we thought we had a wonderful little easy to remember URL called geeks for hope the number four dot com that would bring people right to the fundraiser page. Um, as it happens, that apparently works only some of the time. It's depending on, like, I, I think we're in the wrong ten year span for that particular <laughs> right. URL to work. For this particular technology. Right, yeah. right. So if you are on um, on this, you can go to. You can either go to the worldbuilders.org page, um, and in the blog we have links to the, uh, the fundraiser page, or I did, uh, I'm going to try and point, let's see, over here, there is the whole long, it's tiltify.com forward slash plus sign for its, or worldbuilders forward slash geeks dash four dash hope, which is why we got a different URL, is because that was too hard to say. Um, so we really appreciate any donation. Um, it's amazing how just a little bit can make a huge difference. Like uh, $10 will buy 200 um, surgical masks. Um, $160 can help a nurse take care of like 80 patients uh, for, for a day. So it's like, it, it's, it, it makes a huge difference and we're really leveraging that, uh, the power of geeks to come together, to talk with people like you who create the stories that we love and that we love to be a part of, um, and then bring it into our world. So that I think is a good enough uh, commercial. Now I'll take a quick drink. Um, I do recommend Noble Oak. It's not too bad. It's uh, I know I know you also enjoy enjoy spirits on occasion. So I do. Yeah. I do. yeah I'll take a note. <laughs> um, you write in. I mean, kind of an ongoing theme to some level or other in your stories is some level of apocalypse. I mean, you even named the short stories Apocalypse Nix mm -hmm. when you did the short stories. Um, so um, now that we are going through our own little version of the apocalypse, um, I guess, you know, you being the expert, how are we doing? It's fairly mild as apocalypse. True, true. But it is definitely a, the world has changed and we really world don't know if it's going to change. Or we, I won't say we don't know if it's going to change back. I think we know that it's not going yeah, to change well, back. No. But we don't really know what it's going to look like. And I mean, I have my own opinion of the way that humanity is reacting, but like you said, you're always interested in how people will react in things. Did you, are we reacting the way you'd expect or are you, is it like you sit there and go, like I usually do, what the <laughs> expletive deleted is going on here? <laughs> um, 
so I was rewatching Carnival, uh, mm. the HBO series uh, earlier um, this week, and mm. it reminded, and it was, of course, the Great is set during the Great Depression. Um, you know, everything's awful. The banks are taking away everybody's homes. One in four people is out of work. Um, that nobody is really sure, you know, what comes next. And it reminded me very much of this space that we're living in, which I, is a liminal space, right? It's a space hmm. that we are living in that is between what came before and what will come after. And the reason we all feel so weird is because that's that's how we're living. It's like living in an airport. <laughs> right? We're coming from somewhere, going to somewhere else. And in the meantime, we're like stuck in this airport and it's very surreal. Like, where There's are we going? a long going? line at the Jamba Juice. And, that, yeah. and we're living right that goes Groundhog Day, though. So, Mm. When is this going to be over? I think, you know, the first month, um, I've been quarantined since, like, March 11th, because uh, Ohio moved fairly quickly. Um, and I'm high risk, my husband's high risk. And, uh, you know, that first month, it was like, okay, yeah, you know, well, I'm do, but just do my work, and I'll take advantage of this time. So the second month, it starts to, you know, you start to, you start to realize, like, it's, it's 18 months for a vaccine, right? Like, I'm not going to travel for 18 months if my dad dies. You know, I can't, I'm not getting on a plane to Washington State, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> and so you start to realize, right, that you're living, that it, it is a, a space of time that you're living in, that is, it, it is um, go- completely different from what comes before and what is after. And, you know, I was, I was in my garden uh, as well, and I was looking up, and somebody was flying in a little um, Piper Cub plane, um, just a little hobby plane. And I waved to it, you know, I was like, oh. There's a human oh, up there. Um, and it reminded me of a story my grandma had told me. Um, she lived in Nazi occupied France. And um, she would always say that you could, you could, you know, tell the difference between the American and German planes when they go over overhead because the sound of the engine was different. Um, and there was a firefight one time, you know, above her. And I'm just standing in my garden, thinking of my grandmother, living in, again, a liminal space, right? Like, her world was over. The Nazis taken over they were only a, they they were taking over for only a certain period of time but the world after that was going to be super different and there was an uncertainty in the time she was living in right of what the hell is going to happen we don't know um you know my friends told me round up and shot you know tomorrow and it was it was that liminal space um so there's some comfort in that knowing that these sorts of spaces have existed right mm-hmm. throughout time and, and generations and all of that it's just not any of none of us have actually experienced something at this particular scale since 1918. Um, and so I look at it as not it's not apocalypse. Humanity goes on. Um, you know the the world as you know it is different, uh, but there are still going to be humans in it. Um, and I think that that's where we get stuck sometimes. We keep kind of wishing for that end of the world so that we don't have to worry about the future. When the truth is. There, there is a future, and it's more anxiety-inducing because we don't yeah. know. <laughs> now, should I bother with a 401k? I don't know. Um, and it kind of kills the the fun of apocalypse because the fun <laughs> of apocalypse is, but my 401k, I'm not investing in the future. I'm doing what I like. When in fact, there's no, there it, you know, it's it's not. That's not how the apocalypse works. Worlds are ending all the time. Mm. Um, the way that we understand the world is, is changing all the time. Um, you know, I think a lot about, um, you know, uh, colonialism as well. And, of course, wars and the same thing. Worlds end. Um, but they are not, but there's not like, oh, everybody's died in this movie. It's transformed. And it becomes something else. Um, so, uh, so I think it's, you know, uh, certainly something that we, when those of us who survive it, you know, uh, are, are telling the, the youngsters uh, about it in the future, it'll be one of those times when we're just like, God, shut up, it's so boring. You all, you sat at home and you watched Netflix and you didn't know what was going to happen. <laughs> I don't care. I want to go outside. You know, whatever. And put them, they'll put on their little fashion mask and, and we'll get them toilet paper every Christmas. Here's yeah. the toilet paper that grandma. Where's the toilet paper grandma? I have enough toilet paper. She's been weird since then. I've been, yeah. My grandma went through the Great Depression, right? So they uh-huh. would be weird about food. They would, like, hoard food and stuff. And I do. I think about that. I'm like, do you have enough toilet paper, Johnny? You 
you know, we're going to be those people. Um, and it will. It's going to change. And it's going to change us right in funny way. But men, there is. There's a mental health aspect. We're going to be very different people um, mm -hmm. on the other side of this. I have nightmares about crowds now. <laughs> I know. So like, I know. Oh. It just. Um, I, so, I think about we used to go to conventions. I mean, there used to be right? places where huge groups of people would come together and huddle without masks. And I mean, trying to explain that to my grandson, I think, is going to be weird. I think you know, so. in ten and years. We'd shake hands and we would all hug. And I had a, a nightmare that I had gone to Confusion, um, and, which is a great little con uh, that I go to like every year, and that I I hugged a friend and then realized what I had done. I was like. We're all gonna die. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it is. It's doing weird shit to us. Um, and uh, again, I think it's important for people to know there's a life on the other side of it. It's a crappy place to live in right now. It is a liminal space. Um, it has a beginning. It's going to have an end. There's gonna be a different world on the other side. It sucks. It's rough. But we'll, you know, a lot of us are gonna get through it. It's true. Not everyone's getting through it, and I've been saying that for. Four years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, you've been you've been calling you've been calling us for a while. Well, yeah. Day one. Yeah. When you're mm -hmm. like, oh, do you did you you know anticipate that this man? I'm like, well, yeah. Four years ago, I sure did. Um, I anticipated quite a bit. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, is, is there any I, one aspect that is surprising though? Because yeah, you you kind of called it as it is going, but yeah. I mean, Our governor and uh, the Ohio Department of Public Health, Dr. Amy Acton, mm -hmm. are, are on it. They yeah, DeWine's doing it. In yeah. charge. Yeah, um, and they're struggling. They're, they don't want to open stuff, but they are struggling with financial stuff, and they've made it very clear that you know the federal government is not here to help them, and they've got to figure out some way to make this work because they're going to run it in 13 weeks. We're out of money. Um, so they are, you know, they've been very open and honest and very clear. Uh, they have great uh, daily briefings, you know, like Monday through Saturday. Um, and they're, I feel like an adult is in charge. So mm -hmm. at least at the state level, some of us at the state level have adults in charge. Of course, the problem is without, you know, a blanket, you know, over that, that people move between states and, you know, the snowbirds come back from Florida, you know, mm -hmm. um, and uh, kids come back from spring break. So we've still got that problem. But I've, I've been surprised um, about how much I've learned about local government and how local government works because of this, because we've been on our own, uh, how much the states, you know, um, are absolutely completely. Yeah, I, I suspected that I would live to see the balkanization of the United States. I didn't think it would happen like this. I was yeah, like, it's very interesting. It's very. Yeah, and, like, and the, yeah, how the states are kind of just forming coalitions yeah. so that they can be like, okay, we're going to open like this, we're going to do this. Um, and it's out of absolute necessity. And you see how it happens right. now, right? Like you're just like, when there's no one in charge, somebody has to step up. Um, yeah. There's no, there's not a strong federal government. And someone else had talked about, yeah, it's very much, it's very much like the early United States when the federal government really had no power. Now, mm -hmm. of course, they have tons of power. They're just, they're Doing confident. their own, thing. yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, you, you, um, yeah. And so, so there, so it is, it's very much like um, the early days where it's like, you're on your own, you know, good, good luck. So that, that part is, that part's been very interesting to see how local governments are handling it. So. If, um, if a, a little house elf appeared and said, hey, Cameron, uh, you can pick one thing that we will come out of this with. Like there's, there's like one thing that one characteristic or habit or thing that we will carry with us out of this uh thing on into the next world what would you what would you like to see humanity develop universal health care <laughs> yeah. dear god america yeah <laughs> i mean i say that very, everyone else is like all my friends in europe are like wow you guys are so and i'm like i know but listen um you know the importance of universal health care uh and that uh, public health is a public safety issue and so it should be funded like the police like firefighters um, it's a it's public safety, uh, and I, I, I think that we're starting to see that quite a bit. What I'm also loving seeing, of course, is uh, workers coming together uh, to demand better protections uh, and yeah. better, um, you know, working environments and more money and more benefits because they deserve it. Uh, and because, you know, a lot of these places 
uh, what I would love to see is, is certainly more of that. Um, you know, I, I know someone who actually has gotten a union job and it's like the best thing in the whole world. And there's a reason that they have been union busting for 40 years um, because they work. They work. Yeah. Uh, and they, they bring prosperity back away from the bosses, right? Because God knows, you know, the, oh, no, they can't have their 65th home in Malibu. Uh, but you can have a working <laughs> wage, you know, and possibly your own home. Wouldn't that be great? Um, what a concept. So, and and yeah, vacation, so you know. Yeah. Yeah. The... Um... <laughs> Do you, do you think that there's, I, I there are a lot of geeks, especially, who sort of are like, like, I've been training my whole life for this moment, you know, I can stay home and, and communicate with my friends on the computer and game all day, and yes. and I know you you had started doing the uh, the the painting, you know, sort of the Bob Ross videos, and then you do the, you do the painting, which I, I'm like, I look at it and going, you know, that was like, you were like practicing for quarantine before it happened. <laughs> <laughs> um uh, so, you know, and just along that lines of geeks doing good, I mean, it's something that we uh, at World Builders, especially, we've been just constantly racking our brains and I think, where can we do some good? What can we do to uh, help our people in the liminal space and how can we help push through to, to whatever comes next? I, I don't think universal basic or universal health care is quite within our purview. Um, but do you see any, any role that geeks have in this, uh, this mild apocalypse? I think I have over a thousand people subscribing to my Patreon and uh, 17,000, 18,000 people on Twitter. And I, I think about that a, quite a bit, right? It's not like the hugest, but it, there's that's a substantial amount of folks. And they come to me um, a lot of times asking for hope, right? Lots of times. Mm -hmm. So when I'm not feeling hopeful, <laughs> that can be hard. Um, I do my best to try to put things again, because I, I am a historian by training, and so I try and put things in historical perspective when I talk to, um, you know, my audience and stuff about that, and try to, I do try and stay very positive. Um, not not only for myself, because that's great day to day, but just because you do, you do understand that responsibility um, when you have, you know, these, these followings, you have people who come to you for these sorts of things. Um, so I think about that quite a bit is, uh, you know, what, what can I provide that will spark joy, right? Or oh, yeah, joy yeah. Or hope. Um, I've heard a lot of people, from a lot of people, um, when uh, I do a, a pep talk uh, once a month and they're just like, oh, man, I really need to hear that or, uh, you know, that's, it's so great to put that in perspective. Um, and I think there is a, a responsibility once you have such an audience of such reach um, that you do something, you know, positive with it. Um, and I think that that's a lot of my work as well. It's not just for me. It's also for the people who are like me and wanted to read those, you know, particular stories. Right. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, I, I think providing, providing hope right now, it, it may seem like, oh, it's not, and it's not money, and it'd be great if we could all, ha you know, have more money, and that's wonderful. Um, but it's also reminding people there's a world on the other side. Mm -hmm. To me, that's huge. This is a liminal space. This is not the apocalypse. This is the end of one world, and it's, you know, the beginning of another one. Um, you know, oh, there's a quote. Um, I forget who it's by, but it's, the old world is dying. The new world is waiting to be born. Now is the time of monsters. Ooh, I forget who it's by. Ooh. It's a great quote. Google it. Um, yeah. I think about that constantly. That's how much I think yeah. about it. <laughs> and, and your glasses fly off. I think about it constantly yeah. because, because uh, I'm obsessed with it because it is true. It's like, and, it, I, and I try to put that perspective. It's just to remind people we are going to get through this. It will be different, but we can do it. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot of that as well. Yeah, I um I often think about uh, I think it was from the Stephen King Gunslinger um, epic. But they talked, or maybe it was from Robert Jordan. I don't know, but they talked about the world moved on. Now Robert Jordan was the wheel of time, but there, but they talk a lot about how you know that. But then the world yeah. moved on, and then yeah. you know that's how that's how they describe yeah. things that change. Yep. Um, and I, I I kind of wonder that. So you do mention you know like there's some responsibility to provide hope, and I kind of feel sorry for people like like Stephen King who are at the stand and 
you know, Guillermo del Toro with The Strain and uh, um, Chuck Wendig, Wanderers, his recent one. You know, I'm like, oh, man, you guys, you guys, <laughs> there's got to be a level of them saying, you know, oh, my God, what did I, what did I do? <laughs> And they uh, they pointed out there's a global pandemic in Light Brigade. It's like yes, there is. Yeah. Well, that's a hopeful book, isn't it? They're like, it is. As long um, as we all get suits that we can travel through time, sure. <laughs> that's right. We can just travel oh. through time. It's fine. It's I have fine. to say, you know, if you want to think about like in, in terms of pairings, um, this is how you lose the time war and Light Brigade. I read them both like mm -hmm. within weeks of each other. And they're both just masterpieces of, of, the, of the, the genre, which I'm amazed at because the time travel is kind of one of those things you're like, oh, that's been done. So there, there can't be anything new to time. tell yeah. in that. But there you, you, you found it. Um, the uh, uh, where was I going? Oh, yes, I remember. <laughs> um, so you you are already won a Hugo once. So I don't know why you're being selfish and trying to get another one. But um, the first one was twice. Did I just I'm sorry. Bad gray. Sorry. Okay. I, I just got a text that I've been fired and they're going to have someone else come and do this interview now. Okay. Twice. Okay. I, you got So you got it for We Have Always Fought. I got it for um, Best Fan Writer and for We Have Always Fought. So Best Related Work. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so, but so, the, so I, that was my, my lead up was that, you know, now you're getting it for, for novel. I mean, is there like among people that are, that are in the, Hugo Rati or whatever you want to call it. Um, like it's like, well I got that one. Now I'm gonna get one in this genre and then I mean you know you gotta collect the whole set or <laughs> uh, I will say there is and in fact I'm gonna share this anecdotal story and not say which author it was, but um, <laughs> there is something about the best novel Hugo, right? It's the it's the granddaddy, right? Um, so so Absolutely, Woody Hugo is wonderful. It's amazing. It's great. Um, but when I, because I had actually thought that Light Brigade didn't make the cut, because um, the week that um, they sent everybody their notifications, apparently went to my spam address or to spam mail, and um, so I didn't know for a week. I thought I thought it didn't make it. I was like, well, you know, that really sucks because it would have been really cool to, mm -hmm. to be among the <laughs> Uh, and then a week later, they, they re-emailed me and said, hey, are you going to accept this nomination? Or I was like, oh, my God, I love nomination. Best novel is, I, I think it means a lot. I think it means, it means a lot, uh, certainly to someone like me, uh, any of us who've been in the community for a really long time, too. Um, to me, uh, it's, it's just, I don't know. There is, there is just something about it. It's, it's like, um, like the I best picture I versus... I understand why people get upset. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 there is something about just being among right, those names. And in fact, in you know when the, the list came out, I was just so humble. And they said, oh, it's so humble. I really was humble because it's a great... 2019 was an amazing year for books. I, I still mm. have not read all the books that I want to read that are just amazing. Um, I'm working in a golden age of science fiction. Uh, and so to me, being among, you know, some of these folks is just, just incredible. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there is something about being on, uh, being among those names, you know, for best novel. Um, because that's, you know, that's, that's the granddaddy. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm glad to hear you say that about, you know, being in a golden age because, um, I mean, I, I've read science fiction in my in, entire life and, and, you know, been a, a fan, but I wasn't really a fan capital F. And didn't get involved in anything involving the industry or anything like that until probably the last five, five or five to ten years. Mm -hmm. And so um, when I started, you know, delving in and, you know, the whole the sad puppies thing happened and started seeing all these, you know, things. And, and it was and I felt bad because a lot of people were like, you know, the golden age of Asimov and Heinlein and things like that. And I'm like, well, yeah, I, I, I grew up reading Asimov and Heinlein and. Uh, you know, that was, that was definitely something that I, but I, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't want to say I got better because I still enjoy those, but I sort of go like, well, yes, but I, I grew out of it too. The world you know? moved on. The world moved on, right. I also enjoyed the Lone Ranger and Rin yeah. Tin Tin, and yeah. now I enjoy more, yeah. you know, more varied and level things. Um, and so part of me sort of cringes and goes, you know, we have 
still people having to fight to be recognized for their work. And, you know, there's still the discrepancies. Um, and I, I see in the Twitterverse, you know, how hard, you know, you and, um, you know, N.K. Jemison and Nettie Okorafor and, um, you know, other, other writers write, uh, just have people pile on and dismiss their work or misrepresent it or things like that. Um, the, I guess, I guess the, the, this is sort of leading into a question, which is kind of a, how, um, what is, what is a useful role for, for fans to, to be, you know, in, in terms of what are, what are some ways that, that they can, uh, that you would like to see? Because certainly get people getting into huge fights on the internets is not going to help the world or help things out. Yeah. Like if I if I'm if I know somebody and I'm like, hey, I really think that they would love, um, you know, Mirror Empire, but they refuse to read anything that doesn't have, you know, a great big huge block letter author's name bigger than the title on top of it, you know. Um, I'll get there. I'm yeah. Oh really yeah. Close. Light Brigade. <laughs> Light Brigade. My name is as big as the title. I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, that one first. Right, the right. As big as there the we title. go. Right, there they go. Um, but yeah, I guess I, I mean, and you, you must have. I'm, you're, you're obviously a fan as well of the of the genre. Um, like, how did your transition from going from fan to, <laughs> from my my opinion, big name science fiction writer Hugo nominated Cameron Hurley <laughs> Hugo award winning and Hugo nominated, you know. Um, um. Like what? What changed there? What do you wish you could tell the old, uh, the the former self? You know, it's uh, it's really hard actually to know when you have crossed the Rubicon <laughs> from, you know, uh, scrappy upstart, you know, <laughs> hot new writer sticking it to the man, and when you're the establishment. Uh, and I've, I've talked to several writers about that. Um, Scalzi and I like to talk about that. Of course, I was a scrappy writer who took, called Scalzi out several times. Um, and it's, it's always very funny because you don't give yourself that. You don't get to decide that. Um, fandom decides that. Uh, hmm. When you are Cameron Hurley and when you're the scrappy upstart. <laughs> uh, and it's weird. That is one of the weirdest actually one of the weirdest parts because I did when I, you know, I started blogging in 2004 and I would review books and I would, uh, you know, uh, communicate with other authors and, um, you know, I'd get angry emails from authors because of things I said about their books. Um, and I did that for quite a while, 2000. Yeah. And, and I ended up connecting actually with a lot of other writers and, and industry professionals and things that way as well. And then I think it really wasn't until, you know, God's Word came out and that was my first novel. And so that was in 2011. So that was like seven years of, you know, trying to publish some short fiction. Um, you know, I did, did Clarion in the year 2000. Um, it was, I took the long, I took the long route, you know, mm -hmm. I felt from, you know, scrappy fan to kind of, you know, middling, you know, writer, new writer. Um, and when God's War came out, it actually did quite well. And it was, you know, won a couple of awards, was nominated for a few awards. Um, some other things happened in publishing and the other books didn't do quite as well. And I would, I'd probably say, you know, Mirror Empire was the beginning of, because there was kind of like, oh, new scrappy writer. And the trilogy and was like, ah, and then the rest of my and then Mirror Empire came out and it was almost like rebuilding that that was sort of when my career really started I felt hmm. um okay because that one kind of that sold many more copies and um it started to really get me into that process and here's why also a lot of a lot of writers will come in to the field they'll write one book and disappear publishing is hard it sucks life happens life happens is a huge one other, other people, they'll get a three-book contract or a two- or three-book contract. They'll finish the contract, and then they'll leave, like, for our same reasons. So I felt like when Mirror Empire came out, and it was like, oh, she finished a trilogy, and she's still here. 
<laughs> the idiot hasn't left yet. Uh, and it was like, I guess she's in this for a while. Uh, and there really was. I think it was, I finished a trilogy, and it was me still coming to con, still writing books. Uh, that was the moment for um, the pros around me, I felt. That it was like, okay, so she's 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 going to stay in this. We might as well get to know her. <laughs> she's going to be here for a while. Um, but, uh, uh, and I think it, it you know, it, it wasn't until, and I'm forgetting which convention this was. What was it? I forget which convention. Um, but I started to walk into uh, rooms and I think our people would cheer. And Ooh. then I would be on, yeah, and I would be on, um, I was on public, or, I was on like a shuttle bus between things and people, oh, Cameron, can you sign my thing? <laughs> and it's very funny because, of course, in your other life, Right, you're nobody. You're just like the the lady buying too much liquor at the store, and then you go to these events, and people are just like, <laughs> um, and my coworkers always ask me, like, so are you like famous? And I said, I'm famous to a few thousand people. Yeah. <laughs> to a few thousand people, I am the shit. Um, so it is. It's a really again, so that it's a very strange. Uh, kind of space to live in, um, but yeah, but it was there was a moment uh, again once I started realizing I was being perceived. Um, I started to um, realize that I needed to be more, even more aware of the things that I said because it wasn't just some rando on the internet saying them; it was Cameron Hurley saying them. Mm -hmm. And whoever that Cameron Hurley person is, um, Elizabeth Thayer calls it the authorial construct which is just this idea we all have in our heads of these, you know, nebulous public figures that we've never actually met and don't actually know, but we have this idea of them. Um, so, yeah, a lot of people, um, you know, started to, to have ideas about Cameron Hurley. So I needed to <laughs> fall in line. Do, do, you, do you feel like that there's a, a pressure to live up to the authorial construct Cameron Hurley? That sometimes is just really tiring, or is it is it uh, is it a help you? Does that motivate you? I think, yeah, I think my my agent emailed me one time and said, you know, hey, I noticed you were being a little dark on Twitter lately. I just want you to remember <laughs> that the Cameron Hurley brand is um, is grimly optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I said thanks, Hannah. <laughs> thanks for reminding me. Uh, but it is true. Uh, there, there, there are things, um, and I've heard other people say this, uh, especially in the YA world, um, where you don't want to be too negative and you don't want to come across as whining too much because you come across like, and everybody's like, "Well, I wonder I end your career," and while you're sitting here whining about how, oh, your Chinese royalties haven't arrived, oh, it's stuck to be you. <laughs> um, so, so you try to preserve those conversations for when you're with other writers uh, mm -hmm. and not, you know, be that <laughs> whiner on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, and so that's something I'm, I'm certainly very aware of is the things, the things that I talk about uh, publicly and the things I talk about with other writers, uh, I, I am certainly more aware of it these days for sure. I, that seems like, I mean, it seems like the, the, the more success you get, the more pressure there would be. And, you know, it, it, it takes a level of, I think it probably another reason why some people end up leaving the field is because there's just this, this yeah. perception. There's a perception, and I think what a lot of people don't get is, you know, we all assume um, that writers and, and public figures, uh, that there's all this money that goes with the fame, uh, and there's <laughs> yeah. not. <laughs> uh, yeah. There is not. So, like, I think, and there is an entitlement um, with, especially in the U.S., I feel, with U.S. fans, like, oh, I paid to go to this event, or I bought your book, or whatever, and I, so I've. So I own some sort of piece of you, mm -hmm. um, or I own an I am I, owed an experience with you, uh, in a way that I don't find actually in, in other places. I love a Spanish fandom. Um, I mm. have several books uh, that have been translated uh, over there, and I have a lovely time every time I go because they're just so thankful and grateful that you're there, and they're also gracious and nice and lovely. And I feel like I'm treated like it's like you feel more like you're a human as opposed to like there's a commodified transaction which sometimes i i will feel that's um, got to feel better yeah 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 um because you know i'm just i'm just you know the, you know buying too much liquor at the store that that <laughs> <laughs> that, that answers that 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 question is going is like you know how can fans you know, more support you or the fandom which is to, to treat 
people less like a commodity and with less of an entitlement of, you know, I bought this book, therefore I get to have your attention. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. That. I owed your, your life for the next yeah. 20 years because I read the first three books. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> you bought the book, you got the book, you read the book. That was the transaction. Yep. Um, and uh, I do. I, yeah, that's, that's, that's certainly it. And, you know, actually, you know, speaking of great fans, you know, I have some awesome fans because, you know, with uh, the Mirror Empire books, that last book was took five years. Um, whereas the other two, you know, I got done fairly quickly and there was, you know, lots of reasons for it. Um, but my fans were like super understanding. Uh, and I didn't have a lot of the, the issues that some other, you know, uh, writers do. Um, they understood like, cause I kept in contact. I talked about it. I was very open about it. Um, and they were really cool with it. So, yeah, I mm-hmm. mean, you know, you, you gotta get, we, we, we hold people up on these pedestals and it's like, we all are dealing with trying to pay for our own health insurance. We are all, you know, in quarantine together. I'm picking up dog poop every morning. Like, I'm just a human being. (laughs) (laughs) um, And I think that that's something we forget when we deal with a lot of creators is that because we do have so much emotion, right, and when it comes to um, idolizing people, is that we forget that every single one of us has to be up every day um, and do the tasks of living to keep us alive and balance yes. our checkbooks uh and uh and so yeah i think that's that's important to remember is that you know everybody that you love uh is is struggling you know maybe mm-hmm. not as much as you or maybe differently than you but you know everybody's everyone has their own dragons to fight you know how how has it been? I mean, uh, some people are saying, oh, my God, it's quarantine. I can finally write my great novel. I have so much time. And other people are like, I have no time at all. Or other people are like, I have lots of time, but I'm so riddled with anxiety or worry for my, my I guess they're kind of the same things, um, uh, you know, that I can't, I couldn't write if I wanted to. I mean, is I, I, I will say I, I won't say stalked, but I, I follow your social media and I remember you tweeted just recently about um, writing some pages of a screenplay, and my oh. my brain went, "Oh my god! Oh my god!" Because um, so I, I want to see I wanted you to start with God's War and put that in a movie, oh, and then just go on from there. Um, but so is how is that going for you? Is it? Uh... Uh, it's really hard, uh, hmm. frankly, uh, and a lot of that is you know I you know I'll sit down. It's it's all I can do to um, you know get my day job stuff done sometimes I don't get that done where I have to push a lot of projects and a lot of that is I'm having trouble focusing uh and and I've been very upfront with my agent and with my uh, day job boss about that where it's just and a lot of people are right are having the same problems it's just you have to focus and there's your focus is on this meeting and that meeting and barking dogs and then this is going on and what's happening um and what will tomorrow be like and I can't find a delivery window for groceries we're all gonna die I want to hug someone you know so there's there's all these things, right, going on in your head. So for me, it's been very difficult. Um, again, yeah, I, I, I did. I started, I, I I have many calls with Hollywood people all the time. Everyone, mm-hmm. every, as I tell them all, and I told this guy too, I was like, I was like, honey, if you want it, you got to put a ring on it. Because I have a lot of these calls. <laughs> I have a lot of these calls. And I just said it. And I just said it very clearly. Um, because we do a lot of calls. And, but you know, it was really a conversation. I thought, you know, I would love to got my brain going down and, oh, down and, down and, and it, it felt really good to actually hmm. write something and I think some of it was because it's in a different format writing the novel I'm working on and it was just nice to kind of clear the cobweb uh, and uh, my hope right is that this has been a transition period um, you know since March 11th it's now it's been six weeks um, and that I'm going to my brain is going to figure it all out and we're going to be able to work soon. But I think there is an adjustment period. And I think that when the whole world changes and you're living in this weird space that you have to understand that, you know, maybe you're not going to get as much done. Yeah. Now I will tell you, I need a lot of gardening done. My garden looks right. hot right now. Um, so that is one thing I have been able to get quite a lot of stuff done. Um, I, I've been hauling rocks. <laughs> we have this 4,000 pound outdoor fireplace 
that we just finished. It was like, it's oh, literally 4,000 pounds of blocks and you just put the blocks together. Um, and then I was hauling 50 pound bags of white stone to make this stone guard. Anyway. Whoa. Okay. Now. See, um, my, my partner and I were busy. making box gardens today and, and shoveling <laughs> dirt. I'm, I'm, you know, and I feel like we have to go back out there and, you know, pick up some rocks instead because we were just doing dirt. <laughs> I know. And I, ha I still have, I had 200 bags of mulch. I'm down to 100 bags of mulch that I got to get in. So, <laughs> but honestly, oh, and that's God, my exercise yeah. too is, it, you know, it gets me outside, which is great as well. Um, that so that part, I think I've been doing quite a bit of. But yeah, it's been really difficult to write. You know, I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. Um, and sometimes, again, like again with the screenplay, um, and again with short fiction from Patreon, sometimes just switching it out helps a lot uh, to get my my creativity going. Right? I, I got a hand. Yeah, we should actually. I, I want to plug your Patreon will be patreon.com Cameron with a K Hurley, right? Right. Um, and I can I can say that you know as someone who not only is a patron and but also as a I'm, I'm a patron of several different patreons mm. and you are unusually consistent and um, productive because uh, I I always think of that in general as you know it's patronage it's not it's not a mm -hmm. transaction I am supporting yeah. whatever work happens if you get it out that's great um, but you know your your chat books and things like that are really really welcome surprises mm -hmm. every month. Um, so the one we're running out of time, and the only thing we haven't talked about are the virtues of bourbon or whiskey. Oh, uh, what what, yeah. what do you think goes into a good bourbon, or what would you what, what are the qualities of a good bourbon? You know, um, my preference has actually been for Scotch, uh -huh. uh, and I love the Peaty Scotch. Yes, um, I we, think we when Jarber Crombie, yeah, Jarber Crombie and I um, have the kind of this, this similar love for those Peaty Scotches. Um, and I got into that actually when I visited, um, England for, it was for some convention and my husband and I actually went up, took the train up to Scotland and spent some time in Edinburgh and Glasgow. And, uh, I was like, Oh, I'll try these different kinds. And then I run home and I, I just love, it's like, I, my mouth is a burning peat bomb. This is <laughs> yes. amazing. I can chew it for a while. Yeah. <laughs> I can chew it. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I that's that's what I really like. You know, that said, um, if I just want a good sipping whiskey, I have been drinking Writer's Tears, <laughs> which is a great, <laughs> a perfect sipping whiskey. Very smooth, very cheap, but it's 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 very nice. Um, you just want something cheap and easy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I love uh, the few scotch. The Lefroy uh, is is probably one of my favorites. Yeah, um, I've also drinked a lot of gin. I've been drinking um, mid, uh, Hendrix gin came out with a midsummer blend in a little purple bottle, and it is a delight. Now, it is a delight. I keep I keep hearing people saying that gin is good, and and I I so I, I pretend like I'm urbane that I had you know tend to have my scotch or my or my bourbon neat. It's more mm -hmm. that I don't have any imagination. It's just really easy <laughs> to say that. Um, so like I, I hear about all these gins and I'm like, oh yeah, a aviator gin, they actually are like supporting good things. What's a, what, how do you drink gin? Like what's a, what is the, the delivery vehicle or delivery uh, vehicle for you gin? You know, you'll have to, okay. So, so the gin masters are Kevin Hearn and Chuck Wendig. Oh, okay. All I do, frankly, I, I'm a purist. I have some seltzer water and cause it's low carb also seltzer water <laughs> and gin. That's it. That's it. I might throw some mint in there if I feel like it. Um, but that's why actually why I like, uh, again, the, the midsummer blend is it there's, it has a lot of very floral fruity notes in it. Um, and it's a very different kind of gin. So I really appreciate that little extra uh, bit with that. Cause I do uh, drink, sometimes I'll drink it with flavored seltzer water. Mm. <laughs> I know really kicking oh, it up a notch. Sli slippery slope there. The cranberry <laughs> lime, yeah. you know, uh, but I do, I, I am, I am someone who drinks whiskey neat. Um, you know, again, I might throw a little bit of water in there or a nice cube occasionally. Um, mm. but I do, I do prefer, tend to prefer it neat. So, yeah. yeah. And of course we should say, you know, make sure you are gardening, writing, whatever you're doing, socially distancing responsibly when you are partaking of these kinds of, uh, of um, <laughs> victuals and liquids. Yes. Um, great. Well, uh, well, I really want to thank you again for coming in and doing this interview with us. Uh, it, is, it is truly an honor for me, especially because I've been a fan of yours for so long. 
uh, to, oh, get yeah, to actually talk with you. It's great to talk with you. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> like, you've been a patron for so long. Yeah. I, <laughs> so you're like, let's do an interview. I was like, sure. <laughs> I, I was worried you might think I was a little stalkery because uh, I couldn't make it. I can't, what was the minute one? There's a con in Minneapolis. Is it Convergence? Is that the one up there? That sounds right. Yeah. Um, and, and you were going to be there and I wasn't able to go, but I had... I wanted a signed book, and so I oh, had a yes. friend come yes. up and yeah, yeah, get yeah. that from you. Mm-hmm. That's not uh, weird at all. People do that all the time. Okay, good. I, I yeah, was no, like, don't worry about that. Uh, <laughs> excellent. Well, thank you so much. Um, and uh, those of you who are watching this uh, interview, if you came in late, this interview will be rebroadcast on the World Builders Twitch stream and also on Facebook Live, um, or not Facebook Live, on the Facebook uh, channel. And we will have that little, oh, over there, that little uh, URL linked in that too. We're doing uh, this fundraiser all week long. We're trying to raise money to help bring uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, and also training. This is uh, one of the, the neat things about the Project Hope fundraiser is that they don't just do the, oh my God, there's an immediate need. We have to get this stuff now. But they're also invested in training new health workers because let's face it, the ones we're working now are going to burn out. They are under huge stress. And so they're working not only for what, they're not only working in this liminal space, they're working towards the space that comes after. So it's one of the reasons we really appreciate um, working with them. So thank you so much, Cameron. Uh, it, it is really a pleasure and uh, please stay safe and uh, keep gardening and, and don't, don't go to any conventions for a while. <laughs> All virtual. Yes. Take care, man. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.